Okay, maybe we should let it going, get it going. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone, uh, either on Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, this is the fourth day of this workshop on epidemics, opinions, and the misinformation. And as uh, uh, same as the previous two days, we will have uh, three very exciting talks today. And our first speaker is uh, Tohi Zaman uh, from Yale. Uh, Tohi Zaman is a social professor of operations management at the Yale School of Management. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor degree, master degree, and a PhD degree, uh, all from MIT. And uh, his research focuses on solving operational problems involving social network data using probabilistic models network algorithms, and the modern statistical method. Uh, so Tawhid has done uh, many influential work. So if you are attending this workshop, uh, attend the uh, tutorial uh, on the first day, you'll remember like half the talk of the uh, first tutorial is about uh, Tawhid's work on, on Rumor Center, okay? And beyond that, he also uh, had been studied uh, social network with application on combating online extremists and assessing the impact of bots. He also has a very broad interest to uh, cover data-driven approaches to investing in startup companies using algorithm for sports betting and uh, biomedical data. This all extremely, uh, sounds, sounds extremely interesting to me. Uh, the, not surprised, uh, his work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Wired, uh, the Los Angeles Times, and the Time Magazine, okay? Uh, today, he's going to talk about detecting bots and uh, assessing their impact in social networks. Uh, so before I give the screen to Tawhid, I just want to mention uh, uh, the we will have Q&A session roughly every 15 to 20 minutes. So if you have any question, uh, you can use the chat to type in your question, or you can use the raise the hand, uh, raise the hand feature. And uh, then when it's the Q&A period, you can uh, mute yourself or I can read the uh, question from the chat. Okay, uh, with that, uh, Tohi, please uh, uh, take it away. Sure thing. So uh, thank you for having me speak today. I'm really excited to be here and talk about a topic that I find really important and I think is becoming more and more important uh, day after day. And the topic is detecting bots and assessing their impact in social networks. And this is a project that I've worked on with many of my graduate students over the years. And really this project began uh, back in 2016. So if you recall, there's an election that year and Donald Trump won the election. And then after the election, people are analyzing like the social media um, activities of certain accounts and the Intel community in America uh, had an assessment where they said that the Russians had sent these uh, fake accounts called bots or information agents into the social media platforms to mess with American citizens. Basically uh, amplify content from sources that's very polarizing. And they've basically been doing that ever since. So if you check the media, there's been over the past couple of years, all the articles about, you know, something polarizing happens in America and these bots light up on Twitter and stuff and they're just amplifying the content. Just trying to gas Americans up and make us all kind of kill each other, right? Um, so this kind of suggests that social media platforms, they used to be just like a fun thing where teenagers post pictures of them partying and vacationing, whatever, and their, their dinners. And now it's very different, right? Now it's like a, a platform where a foreign government can deploy accounts to like mess with a nation, potentially having geopolitical consequences. So this environment is almost like a battlefield. So this is called the information environment and the DOD has a whole manual about, you know, their strategy for operations in this information environment. And the environment, the part I focus on is the social network aspect of it, right? The fact that people, citizens of a country can engage in a platform so they can basically receive messages from anybody. And this report says that today's information environment poses new and complex challenges for military operations. So basically it's a military security threat, these social media platforms, and we haven't quite figured out what to do here, but we need to hurry to figure it out because other people are figuring it out. So for instance, Turkey has a whole Twitter bot army out there. So anytime something happens related to Turkey, these bots light up and this basically amplify pro-Turkish content, pro Erdogan content. Um, and these kind of bots, I've seen some of the work I've done. So they're active out there. The Turks have their social media army. 
in the Middle East, there's a whole bunch of bots popped up when uh, Qatar and the Saudis and the Emiratis got a little kerfuffle. The whole bunch of bots amplifying each country's uh, positions. These bots I've also seen in some of the work I've done. Russia and Iran have been busted multiple times by Twitter for having a huge like armies of like bots that get shut down over and over again. And they're trying to amplify, you know, dissent in the country here. The Chinese are a new player here. So recently the Chinese kind of got involved with a whole bunch of Twitter accounts. And a lot of these Twitter accounts of the Chinese bots, they're tied to coronavirus disinformation. So I mean, this is like serious stuff. So basically social media, <laughs> America, I feel like is under attack. Just we're, and we're not really, we don't have the same capabilities that the other nations have, or at least that I've heard talking to people in the military. We're a bit behind the curve in this domain, okay? So as this information environment gains importance, right, in national security, we gotta treat it differently, right? And we need new kinds of capabilities to operate in the space. So to make a battlefield analogy, in this battlefield, social networks, we don't need tanks and bombs, we need tweets and bots. We need a whole set of capabilities kind of designed to combat these disinformation campaigns or influence campaigns happening in the space. So that's where I kind of talk about the area of what I call information operations. So this is a broad kind of military term, but I wanna focus it on social networks, the topic I study a lot. And for me, I kind of thought about, you know, information operation, what does it mean in this space? And I kind of came up with this pipeline of the uh, information operation capabilities you need to operate in the space. So the capabilities are monitor, identify, assess, and counter. So what are these different blocks here? Well, monitoring basically means you want to identify who are the people you think might be under attack. These could be people in a different geographic region, like maybe they're people that live in, I don't know, Michigan, who can vote in an election. Or maybe you want to find people that are part of some conspiracy theory, like QAnon, because maybe they're uh, getting radicalized or something like that. So you want to find people in these communities. But maybe you know a couple of people in there, like five or six accounts. Um, you need a way to basically take those five or six accounts and spread it out to get, you know, tens of thousands of accounts. So my group built an algorithm that does exactly that. Um, it's based on the idea of homophily, that people in the same communities are following each other. Well, that's a simple principle. We can actually take a couple of accounts and branch out to get the whole thing. So we have a tool in our group to actually monitor, identify people we need to monitor for different kinds of attacks. But that won't be the topic of today's talk. It's just one thing we kind of built in this pipeline. The next thing in the pipeline is identification. And by identify, I mean, let's find the malicious users or the bots in the network. So who are these malicious users? They could be like ISIS. So in previous projects, uh, we built a tool to identify people that are part of ISIS uh, before they say anything on Twitter. Right, it kind of identify them, track them, and potentially shut them down. More recently, the threat isn't ISIS so much. They're kind of like gone from the scene. The new problem are these bots, right? These automated accounts that go out there and amplify content to kind of create you know, problems in, in a community. So the first half of the talk today will be about a new algorithm we developed to identify bots in, the net in these networks. Now, finding bots on social media is a very popular research topic. A lot of people have done algorithms that do that kind of thing, but what they don't do and what we do differently is we just say, let's just not find the bots. Let's try to assess their impact on the opinions. So let's build a tool that can assess, you know, the bots are in the network. They're talking to people, hitting them with their messages. How much is that their efforts actually shifting the needle about opinions? So the second part of the talk is a tool we developed to try to assess the impact of bots in the network. And finally, uh, this is kind of really like the most fun part, but I won't talk about it too much today, given the time constraints. But the thing is uh, countermeasures. So if you identify that you're under attack in an influence campaign, could you put your own agent, and I'll call it an agent, not a bot, but it's a bit more intelligent, into the network, connect with the people that are your, your potential targets, and then kind of spread your message to undo what the bots are doing to you, right? Can you do a countermeasure? So I'll talk briefly at the end of the talk about some of the work we've done in developing countermeasures, uh, both in terms of targeting and then actually how to take a account on Twitter and use it to actually persuade people. So I'll mention that for about a few minutes at the end of the talk. Okay, but the bulk of the talk is gonna be two middle blocks, identify bots and then assess their impact. So um, let's begin with identifying the bots, right? How do we find the bots? So bots are a huge problem in Twitter. I mean, since 2016, I noticed that there's a lot more bots out there. I think Twitter suspended like 70 million accounts over a course of a few months. 
So this problem is really getting uh, problematic. And it's because, you know, making bots, it's not as easy as it used to be, but it's still pretty easy. So you can hire some coders in like India or Bangladesh to create you a bunch of fake Twitter accounts and run them for you. So it's not that hard to create a bunch of bots. And then the bots, you know, finding them isn't always that easy. So for example, here is a Twitter account. This is uh, tripping in. Okay, this account has 105,000 tweets. It has 2,286 following. It has 2,552 followers. Um, it has a funny profile picture, no real face there, right? And if you look at the timeline, I don't show it here, but this account retweets a lot. It basically just shares other people's tweets. There's no actual content it created by itself. So we had some humans, uh, actually students, look at this account and try to assess what, what did they think it is, a human or a bot. And based upon their like expert judgment being social media users, they thought this is a bot, mainly because of like the funny profile picture and the bunch of retweets, okay? Now, if you take this account and you put it into what is the, I consider one of the state of their algorithms for finding bots called the bottom meter, um, the bottom meter score here on the right says 45%. So I think there's a 45% chance this is a bot. So it's not too sure about it, okay? And bottom meter, while being a very remarkable algorithm, it uses a lot of data about the account. It uses all of its tweets and all the profile information about it and uses some very complex machine learning. I think it's like some kind of random forest is the back end of it that does the classification. Not too sure about this account. Here's another example. Uh, this is Newsweek. So this is a verified account by the blue check mark here. It has many, many tweets, 146,000 couple hundred following and 3 million followers or 3.4 million followers. So our humans look at this account and they said, yeah, that's not a bot. That is a publication. To our surprise, bottom meter thought it was a bot or it couldn't be sure what it was. It was like 50, 50. And we're like, Hmm, maybe it's missing something here, right? Like why is bottom meter being fooled or not being thinking this is not a regular account. And so it made us think maybe we should think about bot detection in a different way. So bottom meter is looking at the accounts one at a time. You give it a screen in for an account, it collects all of its data, and then it does the machine learning to figure out is it a bot or not. And that's really effective for many times where somebody says, hey, I have an account here. Can you tell me if it's a bot or not? Okay. In our application, we're thinking differently. We're thinking we're monitoring a conversation happening in social media. Can I check amongst the whole set of accounts, which ones are bots kind of simultaneously? So we thought, let's look at the retweet graph of these accounts. So there's a conversation Twitter happening. People are retweeting, interacting. We'll build a network or a graph of all these interactions. And the main interaction in Twitter is a retweet. I share your tweet. And then maybe from the whole graph structure, we can identify a whole bunch of bots simultaneously. And if we're really lucky, we might do better than the bottom meter. Okay, so let's see what happens here. So the data we use for this part of the of the talk is these uh, six different data sets. They're basically big uh, Twitter collections. Uh, there are things like Black Lives Matter, uh, Pizzagate, if you remember that conspiracy theory from back in 2016, uh, the US election debates in 2016, Macron leaks with a scandal involving the French president, uh, Hungarian elections, another topic was on Twitter we monitored. So we just collected all the tweets with keywords about these topics. And the data sets are pretty big, so we're talking uh, hundreds of thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of tweets. So really big piles of data covering sometimes, you know, a day, sometimes months, right? Now for these data sets, we need the ground truth. Like what is the actual bots and humans? So the best we could think up with what, let's just hire a bunch of humans like students and give them accounts and have them manually label what they think are uh, bots and humans. So that's our ground truth. That is probably the best we could hope for in this situation. And we have a couple hundred accounts labeled that way. It's not a huge number, but that was the best we could do with the resources we had. And just for comparison, we're gonna, whatever algorithm I'm gonna tell you about next, we're gonna compare it to this bottom meter, right? So the bottom meter is kind of like the gold standard for detecting bots. So hopefully we can beat the bottom meter with our approach. So on these label accounts you have, it's a couple hundred accounts. We looked, we started studying the behavioral patterns between them. So here we're showing a plot of the label accounts. The bots are red and I put them on the outside circle. The humans are the blue dots, the inner circle. And this is for the Pizzagate data set. So it tweets about Pizzagate. And the only edits I'm showing here are bots retweeting humans, right? So you notice there's a lot of edges here, which means the bots are retweeting humans. 
Here is just the humans retweeting humans. And there's a lot of edges there too, a lot of black in the middle there. Humans retweeting bots the other way, not so many edges. And bots retweeting bots, also very few edges, okay? Now this is on Pizzagate. We checked all of our data sets and we basically plot here the average number of retweets per target for these uh, different types of uh, accounts on the human label one, just that small subset. We notice a pattern that usually the humans would get more retweets from the bots than the bots would get for themselves. And then the humans retweet the humans more than bots retweet bots. And this pattern has seemed empirically consistent throughout the data sets. So, you know, what we observed was what's called homophily amongst the humans, that humans are a certain type and they interact with each other. And then for the bots, we saw what's called heterophily, that the bots and the humans interact, but not bots and bots. So the bots kind of do a cross community interaction. Humans do an inter intra community interaction. Okay. So this is our main empirical observation that we're gonna to use to motivate an algorithm to find the bots, okay? So now our data set is a retweet graph of the bots. So the nodes are the Twitter accounts, the edges are retweets, and uh, the labels of the accounts are bot or human, okay? So when I see this picture here, what I'm reminded of is another picture I saw when I was back in college, uh, which was the icing model. So the icing model is a model in physics uh, the nodes are atoms in a crystal. The edges represent what's called an interaction energy. And the labels are called the atoms quantum spin or magnetic moment, north or south, up or down. And the IC model, if I'm sure most of you know this, but I'll just put it up here for fun. Uh, Ernst Ising created this model back in the 20s in his PhD thesis to analyze magnets, right? He was thinking about in a magnet, what makes all the spins point up and make it actually a magnet. So that's where the model began, but the model has found applications in many, many domains. So from physics, it goes to computer science and then image processing. And then today we're gonna to use it to actually apply it to a problem in social networks, the, the bot detection problem. Okay, so to go from atom to social networks, right? We need to use this model to tell us who the bots are. So we need to figure out, you know, in a probabilistic sense, what is the most likely configuration of these labels or spins, right? So that'll tell us what the bots are. So we need some probability model in this uh, icing scenario. So I'll give you some notation quickly. Uh, we'll give every node a label, L. It could be zero if you're a human, one if you're a bot. Every node can have features, we'll call the feature the vector xi, and every edge can have a feature vector, we'll call it zij, by data about the edge and the people on the edge. Now with that notation, we can define the model. So the IC model is a physics model, it means it's based upon what are called energies. And there's two kinds of energies in the model. There's a node energy, we'll call that some function phi of the features of the node and its label. And there's the interaction energy, which is a function on the edges between the nodes. And that'll be a function of the features and the labels of the two nodes on the edge. Okay, so we have node energies, interaction energies. So for the interaction energy, um, we picked the functional form for what it should be in terms of some of the features. I don't wanna focus on the detail of that function, except for the fact that the energy of a bot talking to a bot, this W here, that W is a number of retweets from the node I to node J. So the data is in the edge energy. Uh, forget about the constants for now, there's, they just involve kind of like the degree distribution of the underlying retweet graph. But then the other three energies, like if a human retweets a bot, or a human retweets a human, or a bot retweets a human, there, this one, one energy, the bot, bot energy times some constant, lambda zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. So in terms of model parameters, we have to learn these three different uh, lambdas and the other parameters basically get from the properties of the graph we have there. So we have to learn three parameters. The model isn't that complex in terms of uh, interaction energies. For node energies, and you might find this surprising, um, we can make them zero. Just ignore the node energy entirely. So any features about the node we don't take them into account. And this works because most of our algorithms information comes from the structure of the graph. And in fact, we tried putting in some clever node energies in there and it didn't really improve the performance. Like all the gains we got came from the graph structure, which is nice because it means for our, in terms of data requirements, we only need to know who retweeted who and nothing else. Unlike the bottom it has to collect all this information about the account, all of its tweets and everything like that. Our algorithm is very parsimonious data-wise, which is great for like the kind of data set you're talking about, hundreds of thousands of nodes in there. Okay, so IC model, the energy of the model is just add up the node energies, which are zero for us, and add up the interaction energies on every edge in the graph that is a retweet. 
Okay. And then, as you, most of you know, the probability of configuration, we'll call it L for like labels of the accounts. It's just the proportional of the exponential of the negative of the energy, which means to find the most likely configuration, we just got to minimize the energy, right? That's all we have to do. Now, to minimize the energy, I got to figure out what the energy actually is, like all those constants, the lambdas, I got to define those. And I got to make sure this fun function is actually something I can minimize easily. So let's see what I have to do to make that, make that possible. So remember I talked about homophily and heterophily a few slides earlier about these observations and our data. Well, we use that to guide the, the order of these energies. So the most likely thing we observe is a bot retweeting a human. So we just kind of state that's the most likely, which means in energy terms, that should be the, the lowest interaction energy. That's the one zero. Then the le next likely one is humans, humans, then bots, bots, and finally humans, bots. So we basically impose this ordering based upon our observations on these interaction energies. That one zero is less than zero zero, less than one one, less than zero one. So that's one constraint. Another constraint, and this is to make the energy actually something you can minimize in efficiently, is called submodularity. That to make the energy function is called submodular, I have to have the one zero minus zero zero is bigger than one one minus zero one. Okay, so I won't go into details why this gives you submodularity, but if you don't know, submodularity is basically the property of diminishing returns. So if I have a whole bunch of like bots and I add one more bot to that set, the increase in the energy should be less than if I had a smaller set of bots and that add that same bot to it. So if this is true, then we can minimize the energy efficiently. And how do we do that? If, if this is true, how do you actually minimize the energy? Well, this is kind of cool. So if I gave you a very simple retweet graph, I said, here's one node, V1, retweets V0, V2. And here's the labels. I'll tell you that this guy's a bot, this guy's not a bot. Now you tell me the energy of that configuration. So energy is the phi of one on X1 or V1. And then for V2, we got phi of zero because it's a, not a bot. And then we have one edge there and it's the interaction energy, but it's the one zero energy because there's a one there for that label and a zero for that label. So that's the energy of that configuration on that graph, that label configuration. What I can do is I can draw another graph and I'll call this an energy graph where it's the same node as before, but I throw in this source node S and a sync node T. Okay. And then I can cut the graph from S to T. So I can do a graph cut. So remove the edges to block the flow from S to T. And what's cool about a graph cut is for every node in the actual network, like V1 or V2, I either got to cut the S node, the S edge or the T edge, right? One or the other. And if I say if I cut the S edge, then the label is going to be not a bot. And if I cut the T edge, it'll be a bot. And that way, any graph cut in the energy graph maps to a label configuration in your original network. And then what would be nice is if I cut the graph, the cut weight equal the energy of the configuration, right? Because that's true. I just minimize the uh, graph cut here, find a min cut, and I found the minimum energy solution here. So can I actually do that? Well, it turns out a little bit of algebra, but nothing too fancy. You can put weights on this energy graph edges in terms of the original energies on your uh, retweet graph. So when you cut this graph, you're going to get a label configuration for the cut weight equals the energy of the configuration. And then you supply min cut to that and you find your, uh, your labels. So that's, that's all we have to do. Very simple. Okay. There is one small issue here. So there's a couple of negative signs you might notice inside this uh, on these edges. So if I pick the wrong values for these interaction energies, I could get a negative edge weight, in which case the min cut wouldn't work. So we have one more constraint, that the edge weight's gotta be positive. And it turns out if you go through the math, this inequality here will guarantee that the edge weights on the energy graph are positive, so you can apply a min cut to find the box. So we apply that thing. So then how do you find the parameter values? Well, we do the following procedure. So lambda zero one was the scaling of a, a human retweeting a bot. We said that's the least likely thing. We'll make it the highest energy. We're just going to fix that at one. That's like our reference energy. Uh, lambda one zero. Well, if I make the submodularity condition an equality, then it turns out you get that this is the case. Lambda one zero is equal to zero zero plus one one minus one, which is the zero one. Okay. So that fixes zero one. It fixes one zero. I have two parameters left, 0, 0, 1, 1. I can plot them on a graph here and draw on uh, constraints 
for the different things in the model. So, you know, it's less than one, less than one. This line here in diagonal is the homophily heterophily constraints. This line here is a non-negative edge weight constraints. And then this blue region is the feasible lambda one ones or lambda zero zeros for the model. And then all we do, we just pick the centroid of that region and make that our model parameters. Okay, so there's actually no model estimation being done here. It's just like, boom, it's that center point by geometry. We tried trying different values in this feasible region for the parameter values. And the good news is our findings are very robust to whatever we pick for these lambda one ones, lambda zero zeros. We just pick a centroid and ready to roll. So pick these numbers for your algorithm, take your retweet graph, find the energies, do min cut, find your bots, and then you can go back and calculate for every bot, it's a bot probability, right? Because basically it's the IC model is essentially a factor graph model. So we can calculate marginal probabilities, condition on all the labels for all the accounts. So we apply this to our data sets and what do we find? Well, here are the ROC curves for our algorithm in the blue and the bot or not are like reference point in the red. So what you notice is that, you know, if you make the false positive rate really small, our algorithm, the IC model one, gets a really high true positive rate, like really, really high, you know? And then it's kind of flat, our ROC curve, and then it jumps up again. So what happens is when you apply the algorithm to the uh, data set, then you calculate these bot probabilities, um, it separates the, in the two clusters. So there's a high cluster here where we're mostly bots, and there's a big pile down here, which are like some bots and mostly humans. And so when you make your ROC curve, like it jumps up really quick because you're just getting all the bots. Then it's flat for a while because it's like a dead zone of probabilities. And then it goes up again when you get to the big second bulk of the probabilities. So that's why the, the ROC curve is kind of like jumpy. But yeah, you see that if you really care about false positive rates, like keeping those low, our, our model does way better than the uh, bot or not model. If you care about other metrics, like maybe the area under the curve, well, in that measure, we are still beating the bot or not. So we're in the purple here. Not by that much, like a maybe 10% or 15%. But consistently, we are beating them, except on one data set. So if you look at 2015 Black Lives Matter, in that case, the black bar is bigger. So that year, uh, the bottom meter does better than us. Okay, so why is that? Well, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but my suspicion is that something happened in 2016 that changed the behavior of the bots. So the kind of bots we see today are following my IC model kind of behavior. I don't know what it was, probably the election or something like that, but the bot behavior, I guess, changed. And in the new kind of bot behavior, our algorithm is a bit more effective, okay? Okay, so, you know, I showed you a bunch of data sets. I found a bunch of bots. Maybe you're wondering, hey, what is this bot's agenda? Like, what are they talking about? And in particular, what are the bots saying that the humans in that same data set were not saying? So what are like words unique to the bots we identified? Well, let's try one example. Uh, here's Pizzagate. So Pizzagate was a conspiracy theory. If you don't know, uh, the conspiracy alleged that in a pizza place in DC called Comet Ping Pong Pizza, in the basement, uh, there's a bunch of children being sex trafficked and the ringleader is Hillary Clinton. So that was a conspiracy theory. Um, bunch of people talked about in social media. If you check what the bots we identified are talking about in the space, uh, here's some of the words they use in this word cloud. And there's some funny things like, well, not some funny, but some regular things like watch the electors, shap shifters, turn off the F mainstream media. But a couple of words I found interesting. There are words like wake up Britain, wake up France. So for some reason on a topic involving Hillary Clinton in a pizza place, these bots are talking about, you know, the UK and France, like basically waking up as in leave the European Union. I don't know why, but that's something they thought was important to talk about. Another example is in the Macron data set. The uh, Macron leaks was someone leaked Macron's emails during the election back in 2017 for the French presidency. And among the boss talking about this thing, the words they were using and nobody else used. Uh, here's the word cloud, but the ones I want to focus on are like stop the globalists, fewer Merkel, Macron dictator. So it seems like these bots don't like Europe. They just, the idea of a unified Europe kind of bothers them. So I don't know why they feel that way, but it seems like that's what they're talking about here. Okay. All right. So that was how we find the bots. So I will pause here for a minute and any questions I can take on this part of the talk. Yeah. If you have any question for Tahit, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. 
Uh, Tawhid, <clears throat> um, this is Srikant. So I, I, have a, I have a question on the first part of your talk with the uh, icing model. So uh, maybe I missed something. So basically you are learning the parameters of the model using some data sets and then you're applying uh, uh, using those parameters to other uh, test sets. Is that what, how you, how you, when you showed those pictures of how well your oh, oh. algorithm performed, I didn't quite understand how you, how you, what the data. So, the you the yeah. I don't actually learn any, like I don't use the data directly to estimate parameters. So if I show you back to what the model parameters are, right. It was these, um, I mean, basically I had this energy function, right? Right. So these are the parameters. So the parameters are this uh, gamma, so gamma turns out I can make it one because the node energies are zero and the gamma is like a scaling of interaction energies versus node energies. I make that one. Okay. The alphas here, these are the kind of like characteristic out degree. It's like upper quantiles of the out degree and in degree of the retweet graph. I think the whole graph calculate upper quantile. Like I think we use a 90th quantile to get a really high degree. That's alpha one, alpha two, in degree, out degree. And then uh, the rest of the parameters, these lambdas, as you saw, right, I basically did fixed a couple of them based upon the general pattern of homophily heterophily. So I used um, this inequality in the bottom here based upon all the observation of the data, but that was it. So there was no like precise grab the data and like pick out a particular value, which is general trends I saw in the data to guide the ordering of the energies. And so then I can still, because I didn't fix the parameters yet, but then I just basically said, you know, I can fix the zero one to be a one, the reference point. I, I choose to make the one zero the lowest value and still make it submodular. That was the choice I made. And then I have all this space here in the blue to pick the last two parameters. And it turns out you can pick anything in that region um, and it doesn't really affect the algorithm that much. So it's very robust to the choice of these two parameters given other assumptions. So there's actually very little model estimation done here, which is a nice part of the model. And when you say out degree, you mean the set of followers that somebody has? Is that what? Not followers. That? So remember, it's the retweet network. So out okay. degree means how many people do you retweet? Right? Okay. How many retweets you for the in degree? So just using your data to get just those numbers, and then, then you're ready to but, roll. But I guess if, if you're tweeting something, uh, how would you know how many people that reached? You just simply look at their, or, or is it, do they have to react to it or just simply? Uh, uh, yeah. So when we collect the data, right, we say we put in like a word like Pizzagate, collect all okay. the tweets with Pizzagate in it. That's okay. a big data. Then we can build from that the retweet network. So on that network, we look at the interaction uh, data, the number of retweets. So you could have also taken the data and then learned the parameters, right, to see uh, and then and then tried it on a test set. Yeah, so if you do the full kind of like, you know, machine learning paradigm, I could basically take a test set and training set and like figure out which lambdas give me the highest possible accuracy. Mm -hmm. But in practice, when people use this thing, you know, they don't have time for that stuff. It just turns out you just pick these numbers okay. and it works consistently well on a lot of data sets we had uh, ground truth for. Okay. So you Great. could do it the better way, but I'm just showing that actually you don't have to. So, okay. yeah. So for Thank practitioners, you. they like that aspect of it. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Any other questions about bots? Uh, maybe I'll take one more question. Hey. Tahid, if, if no one else has a question, I might jump in if that's all right. I have a okay. question. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can save one for the end if yours is really pressing, Brandy. Thanks. I'll, I'll go quickly. It's a two prong question. The first one I think you'll be able to answer very quickly. When you're you know, doing your model here, how do you first flag accounts as bot or not? Are you hand coding each of those yeah, accounts? Yeah, so we're testing the accounts. We had to find a ground truth. And the best we could do was have a bunch of humans look at a bunch of accounts. And we basically picked a bunch of random accounts in the data set and then gave it to the students and they labeled them bot or human. So that okay. was a procedure for labeling. It's not the ideal thing, but it's the best we could do. Yeah, I, I'll look for your research to identify what factors they used to determine whether or not they perceived it to be a bot or not. And then my second question, you bring up the really excellent point that Botometer has these false positive and false negative errors because it's not taking into account the network structure. So I wonder uh, in our own research, we've done a, a retweet uh, analysis uh, looking at betweenness centrality as an indicator of potential influence in the network. Mm -hmm. And then taking those accounts that have a high betweenness centrality score in the retweet network and then running those through Botometer. Do you think that that's 
helping to alleviate some of the issue with bottom meter not taking into account the network structure since we're doing it before we put it into bottom meter. Yeah, so if you kind of incorporate that information somehow, you can kind of like fine tune what the bottom meter does. I mean, bottom meter isn't bad, right? It's a decent algorithm. Um, it's just like, yeah, sometimes it makes these mistakes that extra information can help with. So if you kind of, I guess, put an extra feature in there and tell it, you know, filter on this thing as well, it could probably improve it. And that, by the way, bottom meter is being improved constantly. So maybe mm -hmm. today the bottom meter is like fixed with problems. I'm not sure. Yeah, they're That's actually releasing a new one, I think today or this week. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's always version. growing. Um, but it's nice that our approach is kind of like simpler data wise. And uh, yeah, it does pretty well. So, I mean, you could probably pick any algorithm to find bots you want and do decently. Ours is just like a sparser data wise. So maybe people prefer that. Okay. Yeah. Great Thank question. You. And Andrew, I can take your question too, real quick. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just have a quick question about the homophily, uh, homophily, heterophily yeah. um, assumptions, which make complete sense uh, when I think about it. But it also, on another hand, kind of runs counterintuitive to the, the pressing issue, which is that, uh, as you described, bots can sow discord, right? So, but baked into this uh, assumption is that actually humans don't actually interact with bots that much. Uh, so I was wondering so if you could kind of walk me through. The second part of the talk is addressing that exact question because okay, cool. it's because I don't interact with the bot. If I follow the bot, I see that retweet, right? Or I could potentially see it in my timeline and that's where the influence can come from. So I'll talk about that now in the, actually it's a really segue for the second part of the talk. So, doo -doo -doo. yeah, so we found the bots. And now we can, as Andrew said, let's try to assess their impact on opinions in the network. Okay, so you know, by impact, what I mean is, the way I want, what you want you to picture in your head is, here's a bunch of targets. Targets are regular people on Twitter, like me and you. The bots that put in the red here, they're actually followed by humans, right? So Andrew, to your point, <laughs> humans follow these bots. It's, it's amazing, they have a lot of reach actually, uh, given their fake accounts. And then there's sources of content, some of the polarizing uh, Twitter users or media accounts, right? And the bots has amplified these black accounts and they're seen by the blue people and potentially it can shift their opinions. So how much do they shift the opinions or impact these people's perception? Like how much exposure are the targets having to these bots? So we need a model of how like opinions are shaped in a social network. So I'm sure a lot of people here have seen models like this. So this is nothing new, but I'll step through it uh, briefly. So we'll have a directed network for the social network, like Twitter. Uh, the arrow here indicates the direction of information flow. So the arrow from two to one means one is following two, okay? It means a tweet of two flow into one. Uh, these people tweet at different rates, so call the rate lambda i. If you me really fancy, you could say it's a Poisson process of rate lambda i. I won't mention that here, but that's what we're assuming implicitly. And then people have opinions. So I'll use the letter theta for opinions in this talk. And the opinion is time varying. It can change with time. And people tweet. And the tweets here in these like square that are little birds in them, different colors, we're going to allow the tweet to have a random opinion. Okay, so you have an opinion theta. The tweet is like your opinion plus some noise, some zero mean noise. So an average, the tweet's opinion matches your opinion. But we allow noise in what you actually say. So if you really like hate Trump, maybe you'll say something like, eh, I kind of don't like Trump. Like you can have some noise around it. Okay. So we're gonna allow that generality here. Now, the opinion dynamics is a key part of the model. How does a tweet change my opinion? Well, we use a simple rule here, this linear update rule. And the rule just says that the new opinion, after you hear a tweet, why, that opinion why, it's just the weighted combination of your current opinion and the new opinion you heard. And the weight is this W here, okay? But we notice that the W uh, has a subscript I so it's uh, you know, different for every person. So it's heterogeneous across people and it's a function of time. So the, the W could change with time. We're just trying to allow as much generality as possible here. Um, if you make the W constant and the same for all the people, this is basically what's called the DeGroote model in opinion dynamics. It's a very classic model. We're taking that model and adding a couple of wrinkles to it, like noisy opinions and time varying update rules. One more thing we add to here is uh, what I call stubbornness. So a lot of studies have shown in psychology and stuff like that, that there's people in the social media platform that are stubborn, that they just are not persuaded. So for those people, they could be actual stubborn people, like hardcore partisans. They could be bots. Their W is zero. They never update an opinion. 
And the rest of the people, we're going to assume here, this is the assumption I'm making, that the W is decreased with time. How it decreases, I don't know, but it just gets smaller with time. Um, basically, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So the older we get, the more we hear, the less we are uh, changing. And this is kind of backed up by some studies we found in psychology. Okay, so that's our basic assumptions. So the question is, you have these stubborn people in the graph. And now, these red dots are stubborn. So they could be bots. They could be partisans. We have non-stubborn people. They start talking to each other. After a while, what happens? Well, what happens is these opinions reach an equilibrium. So the equilibrium is given by this equation here. So this is an equation for every blue node in the graph. So what you do is you pick the node I, look at all of his neighbors, and look at the difference of his opinion and his neighbor's opinions on every edge connecting them. Weight the differences by their tweet array coming into him and add them up and they should be zero. So uh, intuitively what it's saying is the person is trying to match the opinions of his neighbors, right? To kind of minimize some kind of like disagreement he feels. That's what's happening here. So this is one way to write the equilibrium. Another way is with this matrix form where it's basically some matrix G times the vector of non-stubborn opinions. So like our opinions equals the matrix F times the opinions of the stubborn people here in the red. And you see from this expression that basically every blue node's opinion there is a linear combination of the red node's opinions. And the weights are dictated by the activity rates, how often they tweet, and the graph structure. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is our equilibrium. More formally, how do we get that convergence for uh, some of you theory folks out there? Uh, we proved that if the, you add up over all the times, the smallest weight in the graph, so take the person with the smallest weight, and you add up uh, their weights over time, if that sum diverges, then the average value of the opinions converges to that matrix equation. Okay? And what it means intuitively is if the W is big enough so that the sum diverges, it means you're listening enough. So you forget where you began. So there's no initial condition here. You get the same answer no matter where you start. So that gives you convergence of the mean of the opinions to that e equilibrium. The next theorem says, you know, look at the covariance matrix of the opinions, call it sigma of t, so their covariance. Assume that the minimum weight sums to infinity and assume the maximum weight squared, that sum converges, right? So this means you're listening not, like you're listening enough, but not too much. Then the covariance goes to zero. So essentially the, the opinions basically converge uh, to like a fixed value in probability, okay? Um, these results generalize those found by uh, Gaderi and Srikant. So Srikant, this is, I think, you might recognize some of these conditions. And in fact, Srikant's the guy who told me that these conditions about the sum diverging and the squared sum converging is something from stochastic approximation in a paper by Robbins and Monroe. So back then in 51, they're trying to minimize the function of the noisy gradient, and they showed that something about the step sizes, the sum of the step sizes diverging and the square converging, you get to the true middle of the function. So we get a funny connection here of stochastic approximation and opinion dynamics, which I thought was kind of cool. Okay, so that's enough of the mathematics of that and the theory. You know, the real question is, does it work in practice? Like how do you use this tool to measure bot impact? So we're gonna try to measure, use this tool in this data set about Brexit. So we collected, I think back in 20, I think 2017, about 10 million tweets of people talking about Brexit. It's a network of about 100,000 people, 25 million edges, so pretty, substantial network. And we picked it because we've been hearing that Russian bots are targeting Brexit. So that maybe it's a good thing to study. Okay, so we're gonna apply this equilibrium model to this Brexit data set. But the problem is, I don't know who's stubborn, right? The whole model assumption is I can separate stubborns, non-stubborns, and then figure out the non-stubborn opinions. So we have to somehow measure the opinion and figure out who's stubborn. But how do you measure the opinions? Well, we had this idea. We said, why don't we label people with a zero or a one? Uh, zero meaning you um, hate Brexit, one meaning you like Brexit. And we'll basically label them by looking at their profiles. So not their tweets, their profile descriptions. And if they have certain hashtags in their profiles, and we made a list of this manually, uh, we'll give them a zero or a one. Like if you say stop Brexit in your profile, you're a hardcore anti-Brexiter. So everything out of your mouth on Twitter is gonna be labeled a zero. Not a perfect way to label data, but it was actually a decent method given the way people behave on Twitter. And it gives you a lot of labeled data very quickly. So with this procedure, we could label like hundreds of thousands of tweets, zeros and one. So like the end of the spectrum. And then we just pumped that through a neural network. So we just picked at a time it was a very uh, common architecture for measuring sentiment. 
Today, you could probably plug in any of those new fancy language models, uh, BERT or some kind of transformer, do the same kind of thing. And very accurate, it gives you like an 86% accuracy on the testing data. So this thing classifies pretty well the sentiment of people. And just for fun, we made an account called the Brexit meter where you can tweet at it and then it reply to you with like what the neural network thinks is your opinion about Brexit. I think this got shut down by Twitter because I thought it's a bot, so it's not there anymore, but we had it at some point to play with our neural network. But now the nice thing is we can basically put every tweet through this neural network and measure their opinions and then average them for the people to get every person an opinion score. Okay. And just to be curious, the average user opinion in the network was 0.34. They kind of leaned towards anti-Brexit. And I've kind of noticed in a lot of my research on Twitter that the general leanings of the Twitter opinions on political topics is usually a more liberal kind of opinion. It's maybe a fact about Twitter usage. I think it's different on Facebook. I don't study Facebook that much. But we had our people uh, opinions measured. And then the question is, okay, so who's stubborn now? And you know, the papers about stubborn users don't tell you how to pick a stubborn person, but we look at some other papers in psychology and the basic consensus there was extreme opinions on the edges are more stubborn. So we can basically pick a stubborn interval and say, if your opinions in the interval, you're gonna be a stubborn person, right? This is the best kind of idea we had to figure out how to identify stubborn people. And we think it's a reasonable approach. So we chose 0.1 and 0.9 as our intervals. Um, it gave us about 20% of the graph being stubborn. And we tried many changing the values of the interval from like 0.1 to 0 0.05, 0 0.15, and the same for the upper one. And we found the conclusions we get are very robust. So the actual value, the precise value of the intervals doesn't affect the outcomes that much, which is nice because there's no really clear way to get those intervals. Okay, so now I have stubborn people. So now we're ready to work. So we can calculate the opinions of everybody in the network who's not stubborn. So that's 80% of the graph, 80,000 people with the equation. We can compare it to what we actually measure with the neural network, what they're saying, right? And if you do that, the correlation of those two types of data or opinions is 0.78. So the model is actually doing a decent job of capturing a lot of the variability we see in the opinions. It's not a perfect model, but it's not a bad given it making very simplifying assumptions. So that's our model to calculate opinions. And now to measure bot impact, well, here's what we do. We just, you know, take the model. We have stubborn opinions measured by the neural network. We solve these equations to get theta v1. These opinions are the blue people. And there's bots in there, right? Some of the stubborn people are bots. Then we just take the bots out, recalculate the opinions again, because this is now the network without the bots talking, get new opinions. And then the difference of the opinions is, uh, is how much the, the impact the bots had. Okay, so this approach, um, it was studied by uh, Asu Ozdalar and her co-authors co a few years ago. They called this uh, change of the opinions because of, the, of an account missing harmonic influence centrality. So we're taking that idea and just applying it in a, in a real setting. So basically we give these uh, uh, opinions, the real values we measure from the neural network and we take out not one account, but multiple accounts. So we can get like a set valued harmonic influence centrality. Okay, so we take our ICML algorithm, we find the bots in the breakthrough data set. We found about 6% of the graph is bots. So not a huge percentage. And in all of our data sets we'll talk about, you usually get like five to six, 7% of, of the accounts are bots. Those are kind of consistent. Um, there's more anti-Brexit bots than pro-Brexit bots. You might find that surprising, but yeah, the anti side is a bit more prevalent than the pro-Brexit side. And then we just apply the algorithm, right? Calculate the shift and see what we get. So what do we get? <laughs> well, here's the plot of the opinions with all the bots and no bots of those non-stubborn people. And you notice um, those bar graphs are kind of similar. So it looks like the bots had like no impact on this Brexit data set. So we were kind of surprised by that. Like, wow, there's a lot of bots there, several thousand, but it seems like in terms of their actual impact on opinions, according to this model I'm proposing, they don't really change things that much. Like maybe they're not followed by enough people or maybe the people that follow are already kind of in their camp so they can't pull them any further. But these bots are not really having an impact. So think about doing a risk assessment, right? If you're trying to monitor this discussion, and you're worried about maybe the influence of bots, you could say, well, it looks like they're not really moving the needle that much. We tried some other data sets. We tried the election, uh, 2016 election. We tried some tweets about what's called Gilets Jaunes. This is a protest in France. And by the way, these tweets are in French, but the same method applies for French. You just put the tweets into like a neural network and they're labeled and you're good to go. Also, I had a French student doing this part of the project, so he helped pick some of the hashtags. 
and we apply the same techniques and what we find. We find that for the election data set in America, surprisingly, the bots actually pull the opinion down so the green bar is lower and the lower part is like the liberal side. So the bots are helping Hillary in the US election set and it's a decent shift there. For Gilets Jaunes, uh, the green bar is higher, so the bots are pulling it up. And up means anti-Macron, so anti-European Union, more of the conservative, I guess, position or non-globalist position. And yeah, they cause a big pull upwards. Like Gilets Jaunes had probably had the most bots of all the data sets. It had like, I think 12 or 13% of the graph was bots. So really, bots are active in Gilets Jaunes. Uh, in this election debate, I think the percentage was much lower, like maybe 1% or something. So much fewer bots we saw in the 2016 data set. Of course, Gilets Jaunes was in 2019 or 2018 when we got that data, so maybe the bots just got more prevalent later on. But yeah, it looks like different events. Uh, just having a lot of bots doesn't mean you're in trouble. It's having a lot of bots and their kind of connectivity patterns, activity levels, and the distribution of opinions amongst the people that are following them affect the actual impact they have. So I thought it was kind of a cool result, a little blog post about it, about you know bots affecting opinions. I was very excited. And then you know the fact that in this plot, the bots are helping Hillary uh, was picked up by the right-wing media. I didn't do this, but they picked it up. So there was a bright article when I was back at MIT about I revealed the bots helped Hillary, very clickbait kind of headline. And then some of my colleagues saw the article and they started yelling at me for being extremist and I got cursed out for whatever. And this has come to the territory of doing this kind of research and these sensitive issues. Like sometimes people just get upset. So if you're a researcher in this area and you get yelled at, don't feel so bad, just you know, do good science is the important thing. Um, also recently, we applied this method to the Libyan civil war. So the European Union actually uh, asked us to analyze discussions about the Libyan civil war. And we did it there. We found a whole bunch of bots, bots that are of Turkish origin, Saudi origin, Qatari origin, and their impact on the discussion. Um, you might like to know that we found that the impact was very minimal on the discussion. So a lot of bots were found, but didn't move the needle that much. So our tool is being real, used in actual applications, which is kind of cool. Okay, so that's it for the bulk of the talk. Let me just end now with the last part, which is um, countering, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions. So countering, just kind of things we're doing here, not in depth really, but you know, if I want to put a bot in the graph to undo what the other bots are doing to me, how do I figure out who my bot should target in the network? Well, we can apply the same equation, the equilibrium, kind of in reverse from the assessment part. So we have the graph as it is with the equilibrium. I could pick some targets and then check if I connect with them, how much I move the needle up or down in terms of average opinion. Now, doing this is actually really challenging computationally because you're essentially solving a linear system on like 100,000 nodes and 25 million edges over and over and over again for everybody you check. So doing this requires a couple of uh, algorithmic tricks. I won't do the details here, but we figured some of them out to solve this problem in big data sets. And we find that if you target people, you can do a lot better than whatever these bots are doing. So in terms of like shifting the opinions, if we target a couple of hundred users on the US debate or the Brexit or yellow vests, and the blue here is our agent targeting people, and it can move the needle much more than all these bots in the red here targeting people. So being smart about your targets can make you much more effective at countering a message. And the final question was, okay, this is all great like theory stuff, but if you really got to do this, if they create a Twitter account, get someone to follow you and then hit them with the messaging to undo or, or change their opinions, how do you actually do that part? So we recently conducted a field experiment. where We tried to actually figure out how do you tweet at someone to shift their opinion and we try to actually shift their opinions on immigration. So we took people that hate immigrants and try to make them less xenophobic. So here's our Twitter account. Uh, this account here is no longer on Twitter, but that was the actual profile we used. It would get people to follow it. It would tweet at them. We tried two different techniques of tweeting. One was we called arguing, which is just say things that are pro-immigration. That's your target opinion. The other one was called pacing and leading, where we actually said things that are anti-immigration for a while to kind of pace these people, build a trust with them, then say things that are kind of mixed, things like, you know, I mean, to be facetious about it, I hate immigrants, but I like Indian food, something like that, right? There's things in the kind of nuanced tweets. And then we tried full pro-immigration tweets. So three phases, like a red phase, a purple phase, and a blue phase. And to measure the impact of the bots, we measured the language used by these targets in the account, like how often they say things like illegals 
or that kind of like extreme language. What we found was that, you know, pacing and leading reduces the usage of extreme language in that purple phase. So this says that when you're actually like targeting someone and trying to persuade them, you don't just say, you know, immigrants are great and you're a racist or stuff like that. You kind of use a, a softer approach. And in practice, that's how you actually change their opinions and implement all these like, you know, targeting and persuasion tactics I'm talking about here in the talk today. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. So just to summarize, right? Information operations is a really important thing, especially with all these countries putting bots out there and uh, elections coming up. Monitor, identify, assess, and counter. We have tools for all parts of this. Um, you saw today how to identify bots and one way to assess their impact. And if you wanna learn more about this stuff, we have the paper here on archive. You can read all the details about it. And with that, I will stop. Thank you guys for tuning in today and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Takeda, for the excellent talk. Uh, so I saw a question uh, on chat from um, Brandy. Maybe uh, Brandy, uh, you can unmute yourself and go first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that really insightful presentation. So my question was around how can we identify who is behind the creation of these bots yep. and botnets? Because in our own research, we have this feeling that there are some domestic creators of these botnets, but there's, we, we have no idea how we could actually prove that. Yeah. So, I mean, that question you notice, I never say like, these are Russian bots talking about this or that, because I don't know what the origin is. I know on things like a Libyan project that the bots basically declared they love a country. So they like love Saudi Arabia, they love Turkey, or they talk in Turkish. So we say they're, you know, they're pretending to be from that country, but who actually made them? I can't really say that. I think we need more data about the accounts, IP addresses, and the times they're active, and when they're created, things like that to figure out those things. But I think that's a problem a bit beyond my wheelhouse, but an important problem. Thank you. Um, I can go next if nobody else has, has a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, How long question? Oh, okay, if somebody else has a question, go yeah. ahead. So, uh... Because your work uh, scalared opinions, right, from zero to one. You, you say that again, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so you scalar opinion, right? Yeah. So is there any algorithm, scalar algorithm, to scalar the opinion from the post message in Twitter, for example? So you're saying, is there other ways to take a tweet and get an opinion from it? Yeah, from their message. Yeah, so I feel like um, the way Twitter language is constructed is very kind of simple language model. So basically people on one side use certain kinds of words, hashtags, phrases. So I think, I mean, I use a neural network here. To be fully honest, if I do something like bag of words model and naive Bayes, I could probably get very similar uh, results. Um, today you can use things like transformers kind of off the shelf. So you can use more powerful language models to account for like engrams and sequences of words. So I think today, if I do, were to do this today, because, you know, back in when I did this before, transformers didn't exist yet. So all these really super amazing language models weren't there. If okay. I do it again, I'd probably just use a transformer-based classifier to do sentiment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yes, my question was somewhat related. Um, I get, I've seen two types of talks uh, on detecting bots. One is sort of slightly rooted in NLP. Mm -hmm. And the other one rooted in sort of network science, looking at the uh, trajectory of how uh, uh, the, the graph, how the, the, the bots proceed. And I was just curious about what your opinion is on, you know, the use of both of these techniques and how, how do they, uh, so, uh, what's the interplay between them? Yeah. You know, so the bot game is a very like dynamic game. So the bots are changing all the times. So I will say that the kind of bots I was looking at, this is in 2016, 17, 18, these bots had a particular kind of behavior, which is just retweeting. So if it's retweeting stuff, a language model isn't so useful, but a network-based model is very useful because the interaction is a network-based thing. I think with the advent of like all this natural language, like text generation model that can make fake tweets. I mean, last night I made a bot that basically tweets like me. So if you follow my Twitter, I have a couple of random tweets last night. There was like a generate text generation model just talking for me. I think now in the um, next couple of years, my IC model might hold if they do a lot of retweeting, but if the bots figure out that, let me not retweet because Toby's algorithm finds us, let me just take a tweet and then not retweet it, but rephrase it. So you don't measure the actual interaction edge. You just see like text. Then you need like a natural language based model to detect, you know, the synthetic text. 
So as the bots get smarter, we have to get smarter. But, you know, for at least this year, I think this is okay. I mean, I applied this algorithm in a Libya project like a few months ago, and it was finding a lot of bots. So the sophistication isn't there yet. But man, I don't, I don't know. It won't be that long until it's more sophisticated. Like my Twitter bot really sounds like me. He's talking about Bitcoin and random stuff. And I'm like, man, that's pretty amazing. It's just a transformer. And then my tweets and a symbol of like uh, some kind of classifier or something. And you could just, yeah, I just made it in like five minutes. Some guy at a website, just put in your screen name, he downloads your tweets, then he kind of like tunes of the base model, right? With your like language patterns. And then you put in a keyword and then it just talks. It's amazing. So yeah, that's going to be next. Thanks. Yep. If Lave, there is still time, can I ask a question slash comment? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, Tide, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, uh, also, it's really nice to sort of see many of these models are coming to practice in this kind of setting. Now, uh, the last part that you very quickly went through where, you know, there's a, you call it, yeah, perfect that. Yeah. Uh, the three phase approach where you're calling it pace and lead, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, versus just directly going in one shot. It's, uh, there's an earlier talk uh, uh, by Alkan and Mosul, uh, I think two days back, where he had this very simplistic model where effectively, if I remember correctly, the argument went that one way to take a group of individuals to go from one style of opinion to another style of opinion, which might be very far, is actually go through slowly. Uh, so it might be really interesting to see if how your this uh, insight so, so that you have that model he proposed. I mean, so that model existed. It's called the uh, hegselman krausen model. It's called the bounded or bounded confidence. So it says that this linear shift of the opinion is only valid in a very small region, a bandwidth. Then outside of that, you have no effect. So with that, basically, this experiment is trying to test that model out in practice. Exactly, that model's been around, and it, it's it's hard to solve it because it's a nonlinear update rules so like doing control theory you can't actually solve for the optimal control to pull you, you have to use like reinforcement learning or some techniques but i think that model like most cells model there is real because that's how people think in real life and you know if you look at twitter right people are just shouting and arguing left and right and nobody is like actually being persuaded and i think you know things like this and thinking about in reality how do you actually do it um gives you much better models much better policies to move opinions around in practice Thanks. Yep. Yeah, so our talk is thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk again. And also thank everyone for attending this talk. Uh, please remember, come back around like 25 minutes. Uh, uh, Noah will talk about in the, uh, will, will be the speaker for the next talk. Okay. Awesome. Thanks everyone. everyone.